my gym, you know, has been shut down and they got all these silly rules and I don't want to participate in that. So I, I built the gym and I know there's a much bigger player in the space that's got well-regarded products and barbells, but I just want to support Peter. I want to support French sport and I don't care if I'm going to pay a little bit more or if I've got to wait longer to get this stuff in because they're out of stock. Like I want to do it because he's my buddy. And by building content that's built around personalities, that's what you're doing with your customers. Like you are their, their buddy. You're listening to the e-commerce influence podcast with Austin Bronner and Andrew Foxwell. If you want honest, transparent, and tangible results that deliver lasting value and revenue, this is your podcast. It's safe to say that most of us have been doing a lot more shopping online lately. And if you're an e-commerce brand, that means you might be seeing more first time customers. Once they've made that first purchase, how do you keep them coming back? That's what Klaviyo is for. Klaviyo is the ultimate marketing platform for e-commerce brands. Klaviyo gives you the tools to build your contact list, to send memorable emails, automate those key messages, and more. A lot more. That's why more than 40,000 e-commerce brands like Chubby's, 8sleep, and Living Proof, including most of my clients, use Klaviyo to build a loyal following. Strong customer relationships mean more repeat sales, enthusiastic word of mouth, and less depending on expensive third-party ads. Whether you're launching a new business or taking your brand to the next level, Klaviyo can help you get growing faster. Plus, it's free to get started. Just visit klaviyo.com slash influence to create your free account today. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash influence. You may know Just Uno for pop-ups, but if you haven't checked them out recently, they're a full-blown conversion rate optimization platform. Yes, they've got pop-ups, but also they've got AI product recommendations, exit offers, a Facebook Messenger, SMS, Capture, and a lot more. Brands like Pure Vita Bracelets, Rothy's, and Movement use Just Uno to capture and nurture their traffic all the way to conversion. I recommend Just Uno to my clients as a top conversion rate optimization tool. Now, you can use AI cross-sells and upsells directly in page or in cart with Just Uno Plus for higher average order value. Just Uno Commerce AI takes in your product catalog and then will display smart recommendations based on visitor behavior. If you want to create a seamless experience from offsite all the way to onsite with unified messaging, you got to check out Just Uno. Head over to justuno.com slash influence to learn more. That's J-U-S-T-U-N-O dot com slash influence. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the e-commerce influence podcast. My name is Austin Bronner, and today I've got a great episode for you. Uh, my the guest today, Eric Banholds. Eric, I've known for well since 2014, I believe, is when I first met Eric. I uh, met him at a e-commerce fuel event, and then he came on the podcast six years ago. And now he's back. And in that meantime, in the last six years, he's built an incredible business. His business is called Beard Brand. Uh, this today's interview, we talk a lot about their growth, about mindset things, how things have changed. Uh, we talk about his experience on Shark Tank, what that looked like. We talk about uh, you know some of the stuff that he wished he'd known before building building Beard Brand. We talk about freedom. Gets a little bit tactical. We also get into uh, YouTube. He's got a huge, huge audience and content marketing has been a huge play for them. So I think this is a pretty wide ranging interview, one that I'm excited to bring you guys. I had a lot of fun recording with Eric. Uh, so let's dive right into it. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. Great to be on this show, man. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but you were actually the 15th podcast. Well, we I do remember. It has been a long time. It bro. has been a long time. I was looking back. It was 20. 14. God, uh, and you guys had just hit, I think you said you had had a big month. It was 120 K in revenue. And you were like, it was the first time you hit that. And you were like stoked. Cause you had transitioned it from a community to a business and it was starting to crank. 2014 was, that was a good year for me, man. What, uh, what month was it? Do you remember? Um, so I remember we recorded in June because okay. I was in New York. I decided to move to New York on kind of a whim where my wife and I were like, well, let's go to New York for the summer and see if we want to move there. And so we rented this apartment from this musician in 
uh, Greenwich Village. And I remember like the day we moved in, I was supposed to do the podcast. So I was like sitting on the floor recording the podcast with you. That's why I remember this. Um, so yeah, it was in June in 2014. Yeah, that was, uh, that was right before I moved to Austin, I think. And uh, I think that would have been right around when I was filming the Shark Tank episode. How long did it take? So you filmed it and then it came out. When did it actually come out? Yeah, it came out Halloween of 2014. Okay. So what is that? Three months later, four months later. And, uh, but the process started in September of 2013. Like we submitted an application and then at the time, I don't know if Shark Tank still does this or not, but they have these open casting calls where they'll, you know, you stand in line and pitch your business. We were contemplating doing one of those here in Austin. We had, we had, uh, had it for, uh, what's that? Uh, Austin startup crawl. Yeah. Uh, they had, they had come in town for that. Um, but we just decided like, we're not going to waste like three hours of our life for something that probably won't even happen. And then like two weeks later, they ended up like emailing us. And then of course, you know, the rest is history as they say. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people see the outside, right. And they're like, all right, on shark tank, like this is crazy. You're going to get all this publicity. What was the actual experience like? I'm sure my memory is not as good as it, it used to be. So I, I could be recalling things differently than, than how they were, but it's super stressful, right? You get stacks of, of legal paperwork. That's like 40 or 50 pages long. And I'm not like the type of guy to, to read contracts. Um, but at this point they had already moved past the, like give up equity to be on the show. So that wasn't a concern of ours, but from my understanding of like all the contracts and the questions they were asking, they were trying to filter out all the people who were going to sue them. Um, there a lot of questions like any previous lawsuits and any under, you know, like any criminal history, like they just want to get all the, the liability <laughs> off the table that they can. Like you can, you can really see the show was just built around mitigating liability. We, we went through the whole process and, you'd have to like film like your pitches and send it to people. So it's almost like working in COVID. You you'd like record something, send it over to them. They give you feedback. We never really took it seriously because even if you film, there's like an 80, 80% chance you'll be on the show. And then 20% chance you're just not going to make it. So we're like, well, you know, like we're not going to put thousands and thousands of dollars into something that could, could not happen. So we ended up only renting like, you know, if you looked at our episode, like there's just this wooden table, you have to like, as an entrepreneur, you have to supply all that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So all the set sort of stuff that yeah. that's you, you bring you it have with to you pay for it and bring it in. Yeah. So we didn't want to pay like tens of thousands of dollars or some people would do that and they would have this huge elaborate set, but we just like rented stuff for like 400 bucks or something like that. And some milk cartons and, uh, just made our stuff look cool up on it. And they let you use the TV. The TV is one thing that they did have that you could use. So, uh, we kept our costs to a minimal, they flew us out there, which was nice. Uh, so we stayed in a hotel for a couple of days and then, you know, like it's like you're there for a week, like, and you don't know on which day you're going to be filming. They film like, you know, anywhere between, I think like 10 and 12 entrepreneurs a day. So like, you don't know if you're going to be the first one of the day or the last one of the day. And, you know, you're just sitting kind of like in your trailer waiting and then, um, you know, they may call you back the next day. They didn't get to you or they may never get even get to you. You may not even get filmed. So <laughs> You'll be just, there the whole week. Yeah. And they'll, they'll bring you back for like the next season to film you, hopefully. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff like that where it's just like really intense. Uh, the whole process is very stressful. Uh, not so much for like, you know, pitching to investors. Like you, you could take me to any like tech stars here in, in Austin and I could pitch all day long without sweating announce but the fact that all this is in front of like seven million people and then like these sharks are regarded generally well so whatever they're saying is like an indication to what's going on with your business so there's an effect that uh it's kind of out your outside of your control but we had like really good numbers at that time we had like grown pretty significantly and all bootstrapped and like just compared to like we're it was season six that we did you know up to that point they're still mostly like small companies on there. Like we had just had great numbers. Um, so I wasn't really concerned with them like hammering us. And I knew the numbers back and forth since I was like really involved in the business at that point, dude, man, like walking through that tunnel, your heart's like beating at a thousand, <laughs> thousand beats per minute. And like, you have to just stand there for like 30 seconds as they get the cameras in focus and stuff like that. And then you, 
you do your pitch. I've forgotten my pitch, what it was, but I, I had it like so wrote in the back of my head. And like, I was just saying that for like three weeks at a time. Like, sure. Getting ready. Just yeah, totally made that out of here, yeah. Panels here, found our beard brand. Hope all's going well. Even then you were doing YouTube videos, which yeah, is like helpful. I, I was talking with the guys over at founder, Nathan Chan, and uh, we we've done a little course on YouTube. And so like, that's one of the major advantages is like, I just feel comfortable in front of camera or on mic and I make mistakes all the time and I just let it roll. I'm okay with that. Um, and I think that helps being on the spot of shark tank. So you went on in 2014. What were your expectations? If any, I mean, you obviously had some expectations, what were your expectations going in and how did it play out? Yeah, so we wanted to be on the show uh, because, of course, it's a great opportunity for the business and a great way to grow the business. We would have done the deal with um, any of the sharks. We were hoping to do a deal, hoping to get an offer. Um, But fortunately, because we're bootstrapped and, you know, financially solvent, like we didn't have to have a deal. So we were kind of, yeah, we're in a good spot from a negotiation standpoint. Like we didn't have to back down on valuation and, you know, we're okay with owning the company. Uh, but we do feel like with the right partner, they could have helped accelerate it. So it was a re- it really ended up being like the best case scenario for us. I felt like what happened on the show, y- you record for like 45 minutes to like an hour or something like that. And that flies by. And then um, they cut it down to like seven minutes. So like you can tell any kind of story with 45 minutes worth of of editing to, to kind of cu- cut it in. So I, I felt pretty fortunate that they generally kept the story accurate, like what happened from my perspective is what happened in the show. And the sharks were, you know, they didn't want to invest in us, but they were positive towards, you know, me and the brand and the products. So it was kind of like a win-win situation where we were able to get that exposure, not look like an idiot and kind of prevent any competitors from getting on the show sure. with the same product. And, uh, you know, like still maintaining the independence of our brand. It was a really good experience for us looking back now because it's been what six years almost are you thankful that you still own 100 percent of the company looking back now was it fortunate or is it something that you still were like oh man it still would have been kind of interesting to partner with the sharks you know it's, it's i have two business partners so when i started beard brand it was like uh, me pretty much doing it on my own as a side project and my two business partners bought in to to beard brand and like the, the question could apply for them too. Like I could have had a hundred percent of the business or I could have two, two business partners and you never know how things are going to end up, but I'm very fortunate to have my two business partners and uh, you know, we do distribution checks now and I'm gladly write like huge checks to them um, just for all the, the value they brought over the years, the beard brand would not be where it is today. So the, I would imagine the same thing hopefully would have happened with a shark where they would just bring so much value to the sure. organization that, you know, rather than us being a, a high seven figure business, we're a, uh, you know, an eight figure or approach a nine figure, but you never know too. Like a lot of those businesses are out, out of business now. Well, one, it's been six years. So that weeds out a lot of people. And then two, recently it's been a crazy ride for uh, the online retailer. A lot of people have been doing actually, and my clients have been, been up because of COVID, but it's been just crazy seeing the number of businesses that have gone out. I saw a report from Yelp that it was 45% of businesses that shut down for COVID had already closed for good. And this was like a month and a half ago, two months oh ago. And I just thinking about that number, like how many people are going to be out of business. It's crazy, crazy. Well, you're in real estate, you know, there's going to be a lot of open buildings, you know, like that's going to strongly affect the real estate market. Commercial real estate is going to be crazy. Yeah. It's interesting in being in Austin because residential real estate has been booming here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, people want to move. They're coming in from yeah, all over. New York and, and leaving San New York, Francisco. leaving LA. Um, so one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on was because of a, a tweet that I saw recently. I think I responded back to it. You know, you're talking about, you know, you've been building this business for a while. And one of the biggest motivators to you has been freedom. Oh, yeah. Has been, you know building the business and creating a life of freedom for yourself. Uh, I've been thinking about that a lot because it's also my biggest motivator. Right. And I think one of the things that you mentioned, you're like, one of my goals is multiple passports, which is also something I've been in. Are, I've you, been, are you a DC guy too? Uh, I'm in the DC. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also the last three years went down that path, got multi, got a second passport. Oh, you did? Yes. But I was, did you do an episode on that? I'm going to have to listen. I haven't yet, but I should. 
Uh, yeah, I would, a, I would totally listen to that. So one of the things I'm interested in is how has your, because I think this is so interesting. It's a fleeting thing, right? What is freedom? How has your view of what freedom is changed over the last, you know, what is it, seven years you've been running the business? Eight years? Yeah, I mean, I would say that my life has really become so much more free today than it was before Beard Brand. Um, you can never have, like, if, if you want to have, like, total freedom, which I, I wouldn't recommend as a goal. You need to have detachment from like humanity. Like you can't be married because like having a, a spouse will impact the things in your life. Right. I've got kids. So there's a lot of freedoms that I lose by having kids. You know, I have to wake up in the middle of the night to change diapers, uh, for my little four month old. Like, so you're always, there's always that balance of how much freedom do you give up, you know, financially, that's like the the biggest one that is really attainable and does give you a lot more freedom. So being able to, the things that I like in life are, are traveling, which, you know, COVID has thrown a, a wrench in those gears. Huge wrench. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it'll end. That's the one thing I remind myself is like nothing is permanent. So, but in general, like I can travel anywhere in the world and I don't need to stay at like five star hotels. So I've gotten to the point where I can stay in a nice place like, equivalent to, to your place here and, um, be comfortable and be there as long as I want. And then I can move on to the next place. I can take my family with me. And, and then in addition to that, like my, my daughter is in, um, I call it a special school. It's not a special, I mean, it's not quote unquote special school, but it's like an entrepreneurial focused school called Acton. Um, so I'm able to put her in there, which is very student oriented education. And, and, um, you know, so like, if you have to put your kids in public schools, that really limits a lot of freedom. Whereas, uh, this school system encourages travel and remote learning and things like that. So if we wanted to go to Europe for three months, then she could still continue on her studies. Um, so there's things like that. I'll go to conferences and people will talk about their kids and their schools and how they can't travel or how they can't do this or the school system and absentees. I'm like, dude, you can you, can't, yeah, I mean, you just have to, you just have to do it, you know, like you challenging have, choices. It's a, it's choices. It's like, those are the downstream effects of choices that you've made previously. But you know, the other challenge is convincing the wife. <laughs> so it, one of the, one of the people that has always inspired me around that is uh, Drew Sanaki. Mm. Uh, you know, Drew has nerd marketing, right? Nerd marketing. Yeah. He traveled a bunch with, with young kids and it was inspiring to both my wife and I were like you know, over the first four or five years of their life. They were on the road, living in Europe for months. I think an entire year they they traveled. It was pretty exciting. Um, but I think w- one thing that's interesting about that is how how it changes, right? The the idea of what freedom was when I started my business was quite different than was the same and different as it is today, right? I think initially I was my goal was for more total freedom, right? Right, like the five flag theory or the three flag. Yes, theory. yes. Yeah. Where it's like okay, live anywhere make money, uh, be able to travel infinitely all that, like, and, and have complete time freedom. As you get more of that, it also then sometimes flips back in a sense where, uh, I feel, I find that for me personally, it's evolved and it's changed. And when you look at your life now and you look at where your what some of your goals are for the next few years related to freedom, uh, what are, what are some things that come up for you that you're, that you're been thinking about? Well, you know, to kind of add on to that point, like, you know, if, if you're totally free, there's this kind of like mindset that you're not going to work, right? You're just going to sit on the sure. beach or you're just going to drink margaritas, you know, whatever it is. But to a certain degree, I, th- I think humans um, are driven to work. Like work is, although like it's painful at times and it's not always pleasurable, it's something that's very rewarding. So I, I, I think that is one thing that I've kind of like, accepted as I've gotten older is like, I have to work. There's got to be something I'm doing that. And ideally I'm working in an environment that is conducive to my natural style of work, which is very unstructured, very like cerebral and kind of ideation and visionary. And then like the execution and the task are not on my plates at all. Um, so that's to me, like is the other, the other nugget of freedom I'm trying to get to where I can uh, purely just work the way that I want to work and then have a team around me that can just kind of fill in my weaknesses. Did you intend to be the face of Beard Brand from the beginning or did it lend to your strength so much that you just became that 
Uh, and what are some of the benefits and, and downsides of being a like a very much a face of a brand like this? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question and something we put a lot of thought into. Um, you know, it goes back to being bootstrapped. When you have more time than money, you do the things that you can do with your time. Um, so for me, like I, I'm inherently like extroverted. I love being in front of the camera. I love having my photo taken. Like there's 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 no change in behavior for me to to not want to be the face. Um, it's been great because when you're the face of the company, it's like easy content, you know, like you just yeah. tell your story and it's an authentic story and beard brand, um, to a certain degree is an extension of myself, you know, my vision, my, my passion for design, my passion for quality products. And of course my, my passion for, for really just trying to be yourself, uh, which is what beard brand started from. So, um, but we never wanted beard brand to be Eric brand. Like we wanted it to be its own thing that if for whatever reason, you know, we sold beard brand or I got in a car wreck and I, you know, died or whatever, like that beard brand could still sustain itself and grow. So for the first year, um, I was essentially the, the pure face, like it's a hundred percent the face, like the beard brand Instagram account was like my account. And then I ended up getting my own personal Instagram account. I ended up, um, bringing in uh, Jeff Bon Cristiano and Greg Brzezinski and Carlos Costa, they started creating content. So it's now become like a, a family of creators who represent the brand um, with their own just kind of different takes. So if they don't like me uh, or my voice or my, my style or whatever, they can watch Greg or they can watch Carlos and they can connect with the brand that way rather than everything 100% being dependent on me because I also say like asinine things all the time. And I'm still waiting for that day where I just like get canceled. Uh, you know, it's going to happen. I want to say one thing where they just like dig through like my tweets from when I was, you know, 20 years old and, you know, to talk about what a terrible person I am or yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know. Like well, with that, I mean, you, you guys created crazy, like a really, really passionate following and you talk a little bit, I mean, you mentioned like the idea of getting canceled, but in a real in a real sense, like you do have haters. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Like who can hate like, <laughs> like, like a guy who just like sells products for your beard? I don't know. Well, I think so much of it has to do with, with uh, just volume, right? Because yeah. you've got what 1.6 million subscribers on Beard Brand. Yeah. Then you've got Beard Brand Alliance, yeah. um, which has about 100,000, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how, did, how do you distinguish between the two of them? Why do you have multiple channel yeah so we we split off the we broke the channel up into two in, in september of, of last year the big reason is just like adjusting to the shifts in the algorithm of youtube so our, our channel kind of hit this um flat line i would say uh we were doing daily content since uh, like july of 2017 up until like september and youtube used to reward having that daily content um, but it's shifted from daily content to fewer videos that hit harder with subscribers. And the problem was we had two different types of content. We had these barbershop videos and then we had this like personality driven videos. And they're really like, even though like the subject kind of crosses over they're they're two completely different styles sure. of videos. So people who watch barbering type of content, uh, were not watching our personality, uh, directed ones. So we looked at the data and it seemed like from the data, the barbershop videos perform better. So we decided that Beard Brand would continue serving those audiences and just focus on barbering content. And then um, Beard Brand Alliance would really be more true to the, the original Beard Brand, like how we started Beard Brand. But it now kind of re represents our community and, you know, the personalities behind the community. And and uh, I feel like that's been a pretty good pretty good decision for us to to split up the channel. And we've had wins on the new channel, which, which kind of make it exciting to, to see it grow a lot quicker than, than how we grew beard brand. And it also seems to give you more of a creative outlet. I mean, you've got like videos, you tried to, you were challenged to row a marathon, yeah, which was like probably not fun content to create when you were rowing, but, but like fun content to create outside of talking about beards. And well, it's funny you bring that one up because I, I was talking about this literally like last night about how like that video over the course of a month, you know, it's like a, a longer investment in the content, you know, yeah. there's like showing my training there's, um, you know, and then I, I got cameras on the boat. So I've got like 360 cameras and we got time lapse and, 
and I'm like literally trying to row a marathon, which is really, really hard to do in a single in windy weather. It's not like, it, like the challenge is fun, but it's uh, not really, you know, quote unquote fun. And uh, that video ends up getting like a couple thousand views, right? So it's like you work really hard for this content. And it was something I was, at the time, I was really, really proud of that video. It was like my, probably one of my favorite videos I've ever produced just because of all the energy and effort that went into it. And then the audience doesn't give a damn. And then I can go up and turn on the camera and talk for, for like 15 minutes and it will get like 20,000 or 100,000 views or whatever. It's just stupid. Well, I mean, back to the haters, which is interesting. I mean, I think so much of it is just cool. I always put it in perspective of like my high school. I'm like, okay, how many people in high school were just hating for no reason, right? And then you scale that up to like 1.6 million people watch uh, subscribing, millions of views, and you've got high schools of people hating. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, and I get like some of them, there's like legit criticism behind them. So I think like, the key in, in being a content producer is being able to discern the difference between um, poorly written criticism and just like pure hate. And we've gotten, you know, it's costs us a lot with our business, uh, the, the criticisms actually. So it's even, I would imagine even harder for a barber because like you're, you're putting your work up there. So it's not just your personality and your like delivery style and the information you're delivering, but it's like actually how good you are at your job. And it's like, can you imagine like people saying, Oh, you know, your podcasting abilities are trash. And you know, the best podcaster in the world is Joe Rogan. And you're never going to be as good as Joe Rogan, you know, stuff like that. But they do them with the barbers. It's like your, your fades are trash and you're never going to be as good a barber as you know, this barber. And da-da. it's like, come on, man. Like that's, that's pretty tough. So we, we implemented a policy where it's just like, if it's just pure hate with no constructive criticism, it's gone. And then uh, I talked to one of my uh, YouTube buddies, uh, Talon, who we were talking about earlier, and he's like, he's got like a thousand people that are hidden from commenting on his channel just because they talk trash. And I think that's like pretty empowering that YouTube allows you to to mute these trolls and these haters and just like people who are probably going through like tough patches in their life and YouTube is their vent, not realizing that we read the comments. The, the, the anonymous side of it is so strange and bizarre and being able to just vent on somebody anonymously. But a lot of them, they're not even anonymous. They oh, have yeah, their or, names uh, and their photos and you're like, yeah. you're just the, kind of like a jerk, you know? <laughs> I like to I like to just assume that they're foreign and English is not their first language and give them the benefit of doubt that, you know, they're just not. I think so much of running a business is also coming up with strategies to figure out the thing, to get through the things that are frustrating, right? Like when you create content consistently, people hating is a impediment to you creating more content. So you got to figure out ways to get past it. When you build a business uh, as successful as you've built and you create a category, you've also got competitors, right? And you guys have had a lot of competitors. Oh, have we? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice. How, how do you think about competition and, and maybe how has that evolved? throughout this onslaught of competition that you guys have received? Yeah, I think for us, uh, when it comes to competition, we have concerns about protecting our trademarks, our copyrights. So we'll be aware of anyone ripping stuff off. Unfortunately, our our fans and our customers will just send links to us and we'll take them down. But beyond that, that's pretty much the extent of our uh, focus towards competition. We really try to be customer focused and how can we be, build a better experience for our customers? And then you know, like I've always got this saying, like the cream, well, not my saying, but the cream rises to the top. So if we focus on delivering the best, you know, buying experience, the best website, the best content, um, the best uh, products, then, you know, who's going to beat us? You know, maybe, maybe someone can, can get their venture backed and they can buy more ads or whatever and grow quicker than us, but we'll be around because our customers will come back. Right. So yeah, the, the focus has always been on the customers and if we ever move away from that and start focusing on competition, then the, the company is going to dive into the, to the depths of hell. <laughs> Part of the, the content marketing side of it, like there's always talk about moats in business, right? And yeah. I think it, it's very challenging to build a moat when you've got an online business, especially when you sell products. The way that you can do it, the way you can kind of create small moats are through content marketing. Because you mentioned a VC company coming in, raising a bunch of money, dumping it in ads. Advertising creates no moat. 
right? If you're built 100% on paid advertising and you've got no nothing else, it's very easy for somebody to come in and do the exact same thing. I'm not going to charge pay. less, right? Yeah. yeah, and charge less. Whereas you've got this ecosystem now that has been created over literally years and years that's producing sales at low cost of acquisition cost. I mean, you I don't know how you even factor that in because all the amount of time and energy you spent building all these things. I like to think about it and kind of goes back to our, our mutual friend, Peter Keller. He's the the founder of French Sport, which does uh, home garages. Of course, they've been sold out. And uh, my gym, you know, has been shut down. They got all these silly rules and I don't want to participate in that. So I, I built the gym and I know there's a much bigger player in the space. It's got well-regarded products and barbells, but I just want to support Peter. I want to support French Sport. And I don't care if I'm going to pay a little bit more or if I've got to wait longer to get this stuff in because they're out of stock. Like I want to do it because he's my buddy. And by building content that's built around personalities, that's what you're doing with your customers. Like you are their, their buddy. And to a certain degree, I've, I've built a lot of really good relationships with a lot of our super fans and our customers who come to our events and, you know, hung out with them and they partied with them, shake their hands. And they're, I mean, I'm biased. I, I think we got some of the best customers in the world, you know, like they're super laid back easy to work with, uh, great taste and style, and they care about themselves. So it's fun to be around those type of people. Well, you've curated that as well. Yeah, like, yeah exactly. That's like, that's like interesting because you created this, in many ways, the industry of beard maintenance, even to the point where you've got your own beard. The band holds is like- Yeah, a, <laughs> the beard named after the me. The beard named after you, um, which you know, it, it, I think that's an interesting way to think about. I, I think not enough people think about that. And to, like being customer centric, focusing on the idea of being a personality and becoming friends and, and charging prices that are sustainable. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, there's margins in there to, to keep the business going and, and allow the business to grow too. I think a sustainable business also has margin in there to grow the business. It's not just purely, you know, walking away with zero. You have to have something to put into R and D and, Product development. Well, if you walk away with zero every, I mean, you're one bad swing away from being gone. And that's, and that's tough. And I think that's just not talked about enough that you well, need. It, sh- it should be with the whole COVID thing is really clear. Exactly. Like, there's companies out there who knew there's always the risk that something could happen. Um, and they, they prepare their business. Like they, they had takeout already built, you know, before COVID they just, they had vision and, and like, like, a lot of what's gone on with COVID is like out of people's control. And there's like out, you know, things that probably wouldn't have happened without the whole government lockdowns and stuff like that. But the reality is like, that's business, you know, that's, that's, and that's why you prepare. That's why you try to save. And there's going to be companies who just started up, right. They're only three months old that they didn't have time to prepare. But if you've been around for like 20 years or 50 years and you don't tell me that you weren't ready for some kind of event like this, I, I really don't, I mean, I do have pity for you, but you know, it's like, this is business, man. Like this is the name of the game. You've got to like hustle. You've got to figure it out. You have to adapt. You have to, you know, like talk to your landlord and get like forgiveness for a month. So you've got to, you know, like uh, roll out, take out as quick as you can, hire drivers, you know, like when well, we've seen incredible incredible changes and improvements in a short period of time that we would in, in innovation that's been happened purely because of this, that we had, it's been forced and we would not have seen so much innovation except for the fact that people were going to go out of business. They had to figure it out. I know um, like I like to buy a lot of restaurants or, or go out to eat or whatever. And during the whole COVID, I, I like to do the same thing. I like to support my local restaurants and it's crazy. Some of them like, uh, via 313, it would be like two hours to get a pizza. Like that's how slammed they were with people who are just buying their stuff. So like there's companies out there, even though they're in traditional like restaurant environments that are just slaying it. And it's just because of their ability to adapt and, and react to what's going on in the marketplace. Our favorite restaurant, which you've been to in Terra, uh, we took a cooking class with their chef. He started putting cooking classes uh, just to when they were really closed. He would sold cooking classes to their top, I don't know, the people that wanted it, who loved the restaurant. And then they were putting some on YouTube and trying to create some more lead gen for when they come back to have this uh, YouTube channel, which is pretty cool. Um, back, back to beard brand a little bit. I want to get for people who are you know listening in on their 
on their entrepreneurial journey. Um, what's one thing that you wish you had known back in 2014 or when you started Beer Brand? Yeah, what a terrible manager I am. <laughs> uh, I, I think like the hiring process and the management process uh, probably set the business back a good like 12 to 18 months. And just not knowing how to bring on the right people, how to empower them to be successful in their roles and really getting frustrated with them when it, it's not their fault. It's, it's our fault as managers for, I mean, ultimately everything always is your fault as business owners. And we've always known that, like we've always taken responsibility, but we rolled out a top grading hiring process, which was just like totally elevates the level of candidates. You have the basic premise of top grading is like every step of the hiring process, you tell the candidates that you're going to be doing a, a reference check. And then you'll ask questions like, when we do a reference check with Don Doe, how is he going to describe you? Um, and then you go and you call up John Doe and you say, all right, how would you describe? And you, you match those up. So it's a true serum where, first of all, you're not going to get candidates who can't give you good references, right? Who burn those bridges. The second one is like, uh, you know, they're going to tell you kind of like, what's really going to go on that's done well to really make sure you're getting kind of like B players and above and then uh rolling out um traction or eos uh which is uh basically like built around like uh quarterly planning and uh kpis key performance indicators and then allowing the team to set their own metrics that they have power over uh is something good for us but in those early days you know everyone's a jack of all trades so it's really hard to have have you gotten better? Yeah. I mean, a lot of the success of our hiring process now can be attributed to Lindsay, my business partner. So, um, I, I probably only helped just in talking to her about it, but she's a lot better at, you know, rolling out implementations and ideas and stuff like that. And we always have great people, but sometimes those great people aren't great beard brand fits. So, uh, right now I just, uh, the team is just, they know what to do. And maybe it's part of like they're more experienced in their role for a little bit longer. There's less like volatility in the business. And, uh, but it's nice. It's, it's definitely been nice in the, in the team. Like the transition from working in the office to, you know, working remote has been seamless and people just like to get their stuff done. It's great to work with them. That's great. Let's get a picture. What, what do you, what is your role now? Yeah. So if, if you read Traction or there's this, uh, another book called Rocket Fuel. Uh, the, the concept is at top, you have a visionary and a integrator and the visionary is the person who has the ideas and well, the vision for the business. And then the integrator is the person who's able to filter the visionary and make sure that that stuff gets done. So I would, I, my goal is as much time as I can spent doing visionary type of things. Um, the more value I'll be able to bring to the company. Um, so I would say my role right now is really around visionary. It's around, um, you know, being one of the faces, a content creator. And then, um, the, I, there, I am still kind of involved in like product development and just like, um, you know, the brand and, and stuff like that. So I'll kind of like probably interrupt people every once in a while and, you know, <laughs> put my say in there. Um, but yeah, you know, the more I can get out of the day to day. Uh, I think the better the the company will be. So it's just trying to make sure that all the daily tasks are are off my plate. Sure, it's it, that the I like the idea of getting leverage and continuing to get to the, do the things that you're really really good at. I think is continual pursuit. One thing that I, I always always see or have conversations with founders about it's it's around agencies, right? In the role of agencies, and especially when people are when businesses are younger right? There's often, it's very easy to get sold into working with an agency. And I've seen people get hire agencies, fire agencies, uh, go through a revolving door. How do you think about agencies and the usefulness? What do you guys, do you guys use agencies, marketing agencies? Yeah. I mean, we, we talked way back in the day when we ended up going with fuel made for our email marketing. We, in the early days, especially we were, we re relied heavily on agencies to, to help us grow. We worked with them for email marketing, for Facebook ads or ad buying, and then for like a SEO to a certain degree. And 
And then of course we outsource like our fulfillment. So we always wanted to like keep in house what we're most competent at and then outsource anything else. So uh, recently we, we brought in house our ad ad spend, which was a pretty, pretty new initiative for us and uh, wanted to make it one of our competitive advantages. And I, I feel like there's, it's always going to be a challenge for uh, an agency to understand your brand. So you, you have to really spend a lot of time in that education and having them get to know the way that you think and your core values and get them to think like a beard brander. And I would imagine like you want to work with an agency that most naturally aligns with your core values, because then it's going to be a lot more seamless and there's headaches, but we kind of, we're okay with like moving slowly. We're not the type that will churn through a new agency every two months or every month or three months or whatever some of those guys will do. It's one of those things where because we are, we're not living up to the side of the agreement where we're providing good assets or good voice or good brand that I feel guilty on like leaving them because we're not really fixing the problem. And if we went somewhere else, we'd have the same problem. I think working with agency, the one thing we never did well was invest that time into the agency and making sure that we gave them the tools they needed to be successful. You talked about bringing ads in house for a competitive advantage and it's hard for agencies to know your brand. I think it really depends on what you sell, right? Because there's varying degree of how important a brand is when it's beard brand and brand is in the name. uh, And that's, a big part of what you guys sell is like the lifestyle. It's harder for an agency to have success in that role where sometimes, you know, you'll see other companies that their product is just like crazy innovative and brand is not nearly as important because it's like the only, they're the only ones that have this special unique product so they can sell it like crazy. And often that matches, you know, an agency can come in and do really, really well. I think so much of it I think depends on, how what the strength of the team is too like if they're really really on it with facebook ads and then you go to an agency and they're not as on it then you start noticing that really really easily and that's where i think the churn and burn sometimes happens it's an interesting question i think like it's one that comes up so often when i have conversations with founders like should i go move to an agency if i do it in-house when should i move from an agency back to in-house um because at a certain point it becomes cost prohibitive you're like spending thirty thousand dollars a month on a Facebook agency. How did you guys decide to bring it back in house? Yeah. We d- we decided to bring it in house when we weren't really like we were having, we've always had like good return on ad spend and, um, but we never had like the scalable growth that I, I think is possible in the company. We had to take control of it. Right. Um, cause something was being lost uh, in the, the process. Uh, you know, I'll pay a million dollars to get two X return on ad spend all day long. Like, so if you can spend a million dollars and make me two million, but I think we're, th- there's some incentives within an agency to like, you know, focus on return on ad spend. And then all of a sudden they're spending a lot of time marketing to customers you've already acquired. So you're not necessarily like, even though you're capturing those customers, you're not growing the business. You're just kind of sustaining the business. So when we brought it in house, um, we produce videos really well. Uh, and videos do well for ads. And we just kind of figured like, you know, our, our ad agency wasn't creating videos. Um, they do copy well, but they had weight on our assets. And the algorithm is mostly uh, let, let like Facebook know your audience and they'll target it for you rather than being like really keen on building audiences and stuff like that. So we, we realized like our core competencies, like creating videos, we're going to be able to create ads so much quicker in the name of the game. And, um, the ad space, in my opinion, is speed, uh, less about like knowledge and anything like that. So it's like, learn quickly, get the ads out, make adjustments, you know, kill it. So we can produce an ad in, you know, like three days. And tar- targeting is so much less important. I, I think now than it was right. Like all the pulling strings and ad buying, like that was five years ago, four years ago. And I'm going to say all of them, but most of the big clients I work with, they have open targeting for most of their, uh, conversions. I think, um, another, you know, issue that a lot of people have is like, they'll create these ads, right? Create a video. Well, the video will cost them like $5,000 or something like that to, to produce this like advertisement. They work with an agency or a creative firm is supposed to be like beautiful lighting, beautiful camera gear. You know, they think it's a story that's going to hit and then it's a dud, right? Because people have just seen that for, for the past 30 years. 
and uh, you just blew five thousand dollars and you've got ads you can't use so it's like we'll produce an ad for you know like three hours of time or maybe like 10 hours of time in-house which is three hundred dollars investment you know and then like we can scrap it and move on to something else um the other thing i wanted to mention is like you talked about the brand earlier and how challenging that is well we we've created like a thousand videos and we say certain things you know we'll say like you know, it's, it's not about the beard. It's about the man behind the beard, whether you grow it or shave it. And then if an ad agency hasn't caught that video and they do an ad, like, you know, don't be a wimp and shave your beard, like grow a beard. Then all of a sudden, like your fans and your audience who know and trust you and bought into your mission, they're like, what the heck, what's up with this? Like you said in this video that it doesn't mean this. And now you're saying this. So it is really challenging when you have so much content, your agency has to watch those videos to know what you're saying. And a lot of them, they're not willing to do that investment. First step to work, to work with us, you have to sit down and watch hundred <laughs> hours, a yeah. thousand hours of beard brand. Well, I mean, our, our fans and our customers are so like, they know what the brand's about. And if our fans and our customers know about it, then my expectation is an agency should too. Cool, man. This has been awesome. I got one or two more questions. One, one question is what are you curious about right now? Yeah. I mean, uh, well, we talked about like, I'd love to figure out how you got your second passport, man. That would be, uh, that'd be a great conversation. My wife has, has a oh, German, she's a has a German descent. Oh, how, but she's relatively new then. Cause my grandfather, he's German, but he's too, he immigrated too, too long ago. German Jew. Her family was kicked out of, uh, Germany. And so there was a period of six years that you can reapply and uh get german citizenship so there's only i think it's like four or five maybe it's like even four or five years but like her family's got she's got a crazy family history that her parent her great grandparents fled germany went to brazil went on a boat to the u.s and so we tracked the whole thing down and realized that it was like during that time and applied yeah it yeah took my, years my grandfather he he immigrated in 1929 so it was like before hitler took over and really Start going all Sorry going. Hitler on the- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry going crazy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool that you're able to do that. Another thing that I've gotten interested in as I've gotten older is just like education and creating an environment that allows my daughter to be, you know, passionate about learning, you know, like schooling in general. I, I'm a, I'm a product of public schools and I, I really don't wish those on anyone. So I feel like, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to improve children's education and being in Texas is great because you just have so many options for alternative education that, um, they don't have to fit the the strenuous requirements of like state mandates and stuff like that. So that's been pretty interesting for me. Have you seen, um, Farnham street school, uh, Farnham street blog. I think the guy's name is Shane Parrish who writes like a weekly newsletter. It's really interesting. And during quarantine, he, started bringing in all of these like very, very smart entrepreneurs, finance people, teachers, and he brought them into a YouTube channel directed at kids. So everyone has to explain what they do. And then the kids are there listening and answering questions. It's really interesting. So they decided to create their own school during quarantine. I think it's actually going really well. Like a lot of people are starting to watch these videos because they're really, it's like when you have to explain like a, like a Spanish speaking woman involved in it it's called something it's called something that's cool i'll put a link in the show notes if someone's interested last question well actually what's one thing if you're in my shoes and you were interviewing yourself that i should ask you oh i don't know man how do i look so good (laughs) (laughs) no uh i don't know i I tend to be an open book so like um you know I've, i've pretty much said everything you know one one story that i feel like doesn't get a lot of coverage uh, i feel like there's this whole like hidden world uh, that affects people like us is just like infertility um so my wife and i struggle with infertility and you know being able to tell that story is something i'd like to do to just to to hopefully give inspiration to people out there who are struggling with it and, and helping them learn ways to cope with it and um you know maybe getting some perspectives as to the the pain that that can happen from it. But again, that's not a really a business uh, related thing, but so we, uh, a little bit of the history for, for people who don't know my wife and I, we, we started trying to have kids in like 2008 or something like that. turns out, uh, she had, uh, 
premature ovarian reserve. I don't even know if I'm saying the right thing, but her eggs, her eggs weren't working. So we tried to do IVF and we ended up doing like, um, I think it was like three failed rounds of IVF. And then, um, on the fourth one, we ended up, um, having success after getting, um, her, her best friend was gracious enough to donate her eggs to us. So we got pregnant, uh, with that. And we, we had our daughter, it's great because Eleanor now knows her genetic ancestry as well as her, uh, her mom and dad. So, um, that was pretty special for us, but like, imagine like each failed IVF is like the loss of a child. When I'm, when I was young, like I didn't understand. It's like, Oh, you just lost a, you just had a miscarriage. What's the big deal? You know, like, but this is like a human being who's like growing in you and then fails to, to thrive. So it's like very emotionally taxing to have so many losses. I think we, in our entire infertility, we've had like nine losses total with between like our, our natural pregnancies that ended up, you know, failing. And then, uh, the IVFs that fail. And then we, we went on, we had Eleanor, we had success. And then we, we tried again and had, I think like two more rounds of IVF after that. And both of those ended up in failure. And then we had like one embryo left. So we're, we, we kind of came to the last, uh, attempt for us was to to do a surrogacy, so we take out the the variable of of my wife and and then we went to Denmark and over in Denmark I don't know if it's the water or something but we ended up getting pregnant naturally and um, that's that's my four month old boy so we we had that so we still have that one embryo left and you know it is a bright story for us and I know not every infertility story ends up with with um, having children so we're very fortunate and blessed for that. I remember you telling me, I think we were at a uh, East side tavern and we were having this conversation. You said, yeah, we went to Denmark and, and got pregnant and, uh, the that affordable was, way, <laughs> the affordable way. Yeah. <laughs> Eric's been awesome, man. So if people are interested in, uh, checking you out, what's the best place? Well, yeah, Twitter? What, yeah. What I tell people to do is do yourself a favor and just buy something from beard brand. Our products don't know if you have a wang or if you don't have a wang. Um, so you can get some stuff and you can see the beard brand experience. You can see our post-purchase flows. You can see, uh, how we communicate. We can see like how we package our products and you see how our products perform. So you'll be able to learn really quickly. And then of course, I'm the only Eric Banholtz. If you Google me, you'll find me, but Twitter has been great uh, lately. Twitter's a great like e-commerce uh, community I've found. It is. It takes, a, it takes a while to like curate into the right people, but it's a really good community and you can learn a lot. People share a lot of really interesting things and you're just like, wow, this is free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Twitter is great. It, and if you can, especially if you can avoid the politics. Yeah. Uh, the Twitter, if you can to avoid, see, if you can avoid being trending, right? That's the number one. What's the number one goal of, uh, t- being on Twitter every day is to avoid being trending. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, nothing good can happen from that. Exactly. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Hey guys, it's Austin. And if you've been loving the podcast, you got to go check out brandgrowthexperts.com. That's where I work one-on-one with my clients to help them build faster growing, more profitable online stores. I've got coaching programs and workshops that we host all over the world. Would love to have you come check it out. If you're a fast growing e-commerce business or you want to be a fast growing e-commerce business, you got to check it out. That's the spot for you. We go more in depth than we do in the podcast with comprehensive trainings and coaching to help you scale up. Check it out. Brandgrowthexperts.com. See you there.